Good morning, River Terrace Church. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship. I'm Pastor Ken Bieber, and I want to welcome not only the members of our congregation, but the family and friends of River Terrace Church members and folks from the Hmong Christian Ministry who've been worshiping with us online, and anybody that found us online and you've chosen to join us 
We're glad to have you here. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we gather together in worship and we'll raise our voices in song. And as we do, we'll also be looking at the ancient songs of the Hebrew people as Pastor Brent continues his series from the Book of Psalms. We'll also be celebrating the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And so if you don't have them ready, you want to get the elements, um, the, the bread and the cup. And so uh, you want to do that in the first part of the service for when we celebrate the Lord's Supper later. Although I should say that maybe if, uh, if there are kids out there and, and you didn't get up early and make your mom a special breakfast, uh, maybe you or, or dad should get up off the couch and, and go get those elements ready uh, because today is Mother's Day. And uh, Mother's Day is not a, an official church holiday. It's a civil holiday. And yet, as Christians, we recognize the gift of motherhood. Uh, God brings us into the world through mothers, each one of us, including Jesus himself. Jesus had a mother. And God shows himself to have the characteristics of a mother, a, a hen who gathers her chicks and protects them. But I recognize, too, that, that oftentimes Mother's Day is painful, painful for people. Uh, it's painful for women who wanted to have kids and never had the opportunity. And it's painful for mothers who are estranged from their adult children. And it's painful for, um, for mothers who've lost their children or, or kids or children who've lost their mothers, whether they died recently or, or years ago, uh, this day can bring a lot of pain. And so we recognize that and pray that, that God would uh, bring healing in those situations. Two, I want to affirm that even if someone is not a mother or is a mother to only a, a certain number of children, yet there are so many women in our congregation and beyond who play mothering roles, nurturing others, especially in the faith to know Jesus Christ. And so on this day, we can celebrate that nurturing role. And so now we thank God not only for the gift of motherhood, but also that he is a benevolent, wonderful, loving ruler. Let's sing to Jesus, our King. As we begin our service this morning, please join in singing, O Worship the King.
David tells us in Psalm 103 that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. It's a wonderful thing that we can have our sin forgiven by God, come to him in prayer, and trust that our Heavenly Father hears us. So let's pray now for the needs of the church and the world. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that those words are true, life-giving, they give us hope. Thank you for forgiving our wrongdoings. Thank you that in Jesus Christ, we're not only forgiven of our sin, but also given eternal life. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to work in our lives so that what we do, how we live, would point to that truth, that you are a forgiving God, and we can rest and rejoice in you. And I pray, Lord, for anybody who might be joining us who has not experienced the reality that you have for them in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness that you offer, I pray that your spirit would work in their hearts now so that they would find you to be that gracious and compassionate God. Lord, we pray because you are not only gracious and compassionate, but also almighty, all-powerful. We pray that your hand would bring an end to this COVID-19, to the, the coronavirus and the way that it's ravaged not only our land, but, but the world. We pray, Lord, for those who suffer from it, that they would find relief. We ask that you would uh, use healthcare workers to uh, save people's lives, that you would continue to use those in the food supply chain to uh, keep society fed. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are experiencing financial difficulty because of this time, that you would uh, bring relief. And as our state, other states, uh, regions across this country, as we try to reopen, uh, we pray that you would help us to, to do that in a, a unified way that it wouldn't be divisive, it wouldn't be seen as ideological, but rather, uh, Heavenly Father, we, we pray that you would uh, have those in positions of government, uh, whether it's local or state or federal, uh, that, that there would be wisdom among government leaders and, uh, and wisdom among the people, and that we would treat one another with dignity, that we would uh, seek the common good that Christians would uh, not only exemplify that unity, but also uh, treat every person they encounter uh, w w with the, the dignity that each bearer of the image of God deserves. So we pray for our society. And Lord, I pray for uh, people in our congregation, for those who are ill, for those who recover from surgery this past week, uh, for those who are facing upcoming surgeries or other treatments, uh, that you would restore their bodies, Lord. And Father, too, I give thanks for the, the uh, wedding yesterday of uh, Elizabeth Young with Matthew Snyder, and we give thanks for the joining of Mr. and Mrs. Snyder, and, and pray that you would uh, have these first days of, of their uh, marital relationship It'd be a, a wonderful picture of Christ's love for his church through their marital covenant, and that you would grant them a long and blessed life together. And so we thank you that that could uh, happen yesterday and, and pray that you would bless them. Almighty God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We ask that in each situation in our lives, uh, both those that have been spoken here and those that have not, that you would be working in our hearts so that we would give thanks in all circumstances for your fatherly care. And again, we give thanks that you forgive our sins in Jesus Christ and make eternal life with you possible. We pray this in his name. Amen. Again, from Psalm 103, the words of David, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. From everlasting to everlasting. We have so much to thank God for. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His heart.
So many reasons we can come together to praise God. Worth doing it however we can. Good morning, church. Glad we can do this. Kids, got a little uh, time for you before we uh, move to to the message. Got a couple um, simple questions for you today. Mother's Day. The first one is, do you know that your mother loves you. Now I'm guessing that you would be saying, yeah, I know that. I'd follow it up with a second question if we were all together in the front of the building. And I'd say, how do you know? You can answer that in the room you're in if you want. I'm guessing a couple things would come up. I'd say, yeah, I I think you'd probably say, because she says so. She says, I love you, love you. And you'd probably say things that she does for you, like, you know, maybe now and then makes just the meals she knows you like, or reads books with you, or gets books for you that you like, or my mom takes me to or 
mom shows me how to, and then you think about things that she shows you how to do. There are always that she shows. She loves you. Now here's the second question. Do you know God loves you? How do you know? And I'm guessing you're thinking along the same lines. God says so. In the Bible, there's that song we just heard and sang, if we sang along. He's rich in love. God's rich in love. He loves us. He's abounding in love. That's what Psalm 103 says. And we know God loves us by what he's done. He's given Jesus to have us. He's given us the Holy Spirit to guide us. He's given us health and food and things to do. And, and he's given us loving moms. So today, I want to encourage you to give thanks. Thank your mom for her love, for things she does for you. And thank God for his love and things God does for you, including giving you your mom. Well, if we were together, we would stand up at this point and you would turn around and I would say, children of God, as you worship, and then everybody else would say, the Lord be with you. And you would say, and also with you. Keeping Hope Alive is the title of a wise book by theologian Lewis Smeets. Uh, Smeets says that hope has three ingredients, wishing, imagining, and believing. Uh, in order to hope, you need to, you need to uh, wish for something to happen. You need to imagine what it would look like if it did, and you need to believe that it can happen. Moms need hope. The baby's cranky. She, he won't take any naps. Nights are choppy. And a line that comes to mom's mind is what somebody said, that a, that a baby is a digestive apparatus with a loud noise on one end and no responsibility on the other. Mom, what do you need at that time? You need hope. You need to, you need to be able to uh, wish for something better, which isn't very hard. You need to imagine what it would look like if things got a little bit better. And then you need to believe that they can. And when you parent with hope, that helps. And that's true long after babyhood. Uh, several years ago, I did a survey and asked people what things were they worried about or afraid of. And one of the top things on the list was worries about kids. How do you keep hoping if your kid, there's trouble or challenges there? How do you keep from just being overwhelmed by that? What's your top fear today? Maybe it's kid related. Maybe, maybe it's losing a job or not being able to find one after graduation or or getting sick, or getting somebody else sick, or depression, or family dynamics spiraling down, or a lot of things potentially to fear. Someone said, fear can't stop death, but it can stop living. To keep living, you need to keep hoping. And to keep hoping, you need to be able to do more than wish or imagine. You need also to be able to believe. You need faith that things can get better, that the future can be good. Psalm 27 can help. Uh, I, when I found myself losing hope, one of the things God has used in my life, one of them, not, you know, God can use a lot of things, but one of them for me has been Psalm 27. Years ago, I learned the beginning verses of memorized, beginning verses of Psalm 27. That's something I just encourage you to do, that if there's a verse or two in the Bible that really resonate with you and you say, I want that, 
memorize it. Well, I memorize those verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It, because I wanted that. But sometimes, <laughs> about those verses, I, I felt a little bit like uh, a woman named Sally and what she's supposed to have said about recipes. She said, I read recipes the way I read science fiction. I get to the end and I think, that's not going to happen. And sometimes I would, I would, you know, in my mind go through uh, Psalm 27, the first couple of verses, and I think, that's great, but it's not happening. I don't know that it's going to. And then I read Psalm 27 to the end. And I started to think, you know, this can happen. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go for, with Psalm 27 all the way to the end. Uh, this is written by David, uh, king of Israel, best king Israel ever had. Uh, the one who's called the man after God's own heart. That's the label given him in 1 Samuel 13, 14. So this is David's prayer. And David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they'll stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, I will not fear. The war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. And in his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O oh God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray that, like David, you will help us to fight fear through faith in you and find hope. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let's look first here at what's possible and then um, how to get there. Verses 1 to 6 in this text show what's possible. Uh, David is telling about his lived experience, uh, and, and through that showing us and, and helping us see what's possible. What's possible is for God to be the biggest reality in our lives. The Lord is my light. The Lord is the one who draws my attention. The Lord is the one, the one who gives me direction. 
even more than the latest CDC report, even more than my concerns or my interest in my dearly loved child. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the, Lord is the only lifeguard out there who knows how to swim. The Lord is the only one who can rescue me from guilt. He's the only one who can set me free from the controlling power of selfishness. He's the only one who can keep me from despair about the future. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What's possible? What's possible is for the Lord to defeat our enemies. We have them. David had them. He was king. He was being attacked by people. Uh, David says his enemies were like lions who wanted to devour him. And sometimes they would come at him like with a, a, a gorilla attack suddenly from the side. And in other times, more of a grinding, long term kind of a siege. Enemies have more than one strategy. And maybe you have people, enter, uh, enemies in your life, and if you do, you can apply these straight on that way. Um, but one of the things that it's important to think about when we read the Psalms is that we all, no matter if people, enemies are in our lives or not, we all have enemies in our life. We all have a great enemy, and that is the devil. First uh, Peter 5.8, I wonder if Peter had Psalm 27 in mind when he uh, wrote about the devil. He's, he called the devil, your enemy, the devil, who prowls like a roaring lion, and notice, seeking whom he may devour. Same kind of words that David uses about his enemies. And what's the devil doing in our lives? The devil is always attacking our faith, always trying to pull us away from God. Sometimes that can be through a, a guerrilla attack, through a sudden loss, through a sudden uh, difficulty in our lives, like say a, a loss of a, a job or the loss of a dream, and it's like a guerrilla attack getting us. Other times, the devil works by grinding us down like a siege. And so we're ground down by social separation. We face the grind of not being able to get together with loved ones any closer than by Zoom. And that maybe is especially painful on Mother's Day for some of us. The grind of threats to our health, threats to the health of others. The grind of financial stress. But here's what David says. Here's what we can say. Our enemies are no match for God. My light, my salvation, my stronghold. What's possible is for us to live with a sure confidence that God can overmatch any enemy we face so that we can live without fear. How about, how about a comparison? Maybe that would help. Think of a mom with her little girl. A, a little girl who's old enough, old enough to know that cats can scratch, dogs can bite, lightning can strike, classmates can be mean, dangerous people are out there. She knows all that, but she's with mom. And mom gives her a big hug and a kiss and holds her hand. And maybe they, they snuggle on the couch and she sits right next to mom. It's one thing for that little girl to, from a distance, say, oh, that's my mom over there. And it's a whole other experience for her to have mom holding her close on the couch, reading a book, or just engaging with her on whatever she's thinking about and saying, this is my mom. It's a whole different experience. What's to fear then? It's the later, latter kind of thing that David is talking about. 
And he talks about dwelling in the temple. I mean, he's not ta- taking, talking about um, having a bed and breakfast in the temple and living in the temple. The temple in his day was kind of the locale, the, the central focus of the presence of God with his people. And what David is talking about is a relationship with the Lord in which he doesn't say, you know, that's my God. The Lord is my God. But rather the kind of relationship where he is close to God and he's perceiving the beauty of the Lord and the love of the Lord and the grandeur of the Lord in a close-up way. He says, that's where I want to live all the days of my life. And and part of being in the presence of God was having customized direction from the Lord. You know, Dallas Willard, um, he says that it's common to say these days, God is love. And then to force our bedraggled human version of love into a mental blank where God is supposed to be. Willard says it becomes illuminating to say God is love when your definition of God is biblical. As in the grand and carefully phrased words of Adam Clark's old theologian, and Willard quotes him. And here's what Clark wrote. God is the eternal, independent, and self-existent being. The being whose purposes and actions spring from himself without foreign motive or influence. He who is absolute in dominion, the most pure, the most simple, the most spiritual of all essences, infinitely perfect and eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing that he has made, illimitable in his immensity, inconceivable in his mode of existence, and indescribable in his essence, known fully only by himself because an infinite mind can be fully comprehended only by itself. In a word, a being who, from his infinite wisdom, cannot err or be deceived, and from his infinite goodness can do nothing but what is eternally just and right and kind. End quote. Now, say, God is love. Or better yet, think about what it means that God, God loves you. The closer we are to God, the biblical, the real God, not our dinky version of God, the better we perceive the beauty of God, the more confident we can be that in the day of trouble, he will keep us safe because we're close to him the more confident we can be that he will set us on a rock and we'll be able, even though our enemies remain around us, we'll be okay. And even enable us to shout for joy and make music to the Lord, even in the middle of trouble. There's no room. Close to God, there's no room for fear. It's all confidence, it's all joy, it's all, it's all self-forgetfulness. That's what's possible. That's what verses 1 to 6 are, are about. And boy, I want that. How about you? Can you imagine it? This, okay, I want it. So you think of the ingredients of hope. I want it. Can I imagine it? Yeah, I can imagine it. In fact, that image of a, of a loving mom, strong mom, wise mom with her little girl, that helps me imagine it a little bit. But do I hope that this can be a reality for me, actual happen in my life? Hey, that takes the third ingredient. That takes believing. That takes faith that it can actually happen. And what verses 7 to 12 do is help us with the believing piece. What what David does there in in verses 7 to 12 is kind of lets us back in his life behind the uh, confidence curtain, kind of in the backstage where the gears are and all. And he's saying, here's here's how it works for me. I'm not always like verses 1 to 6 are about. 
And so here's what I do when I'm not in verses one to six. And here's how I take steps to get back to verses one to six. And by the way, here's a parenting tip. This isn't a parenting sermon, but one thing that, that for moms and dads, to think about how, how can you help your kid grow in faith? How can you help them uh, have strength in God and live without fear and live with confidence? Well, one of the things you can do is let them backstage in your own life. And when you're afraid, and when you're, uh, in, 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 further, in other words, not just let them see the curtain part, not just let them see the parts when you're confident and strong, but also let them see the part like David does here in verses 7 to 12, where he's saying, hear my voice, and he's coming to God for mercy, and he's asking for help, and he's saying, I'm kind of in a pile here. And then they'll know what to do themselves and know when they get in a pile that, okay, mom and dad have been there and there's hope here. So let's get to it now. What's uh, behind this life of confidence in God? What's behind David's single-minded pursuit of God? Well, what you see here is humble prayer for God's warm embrace. David says, hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me. Answer me. My heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Don't hide your face from me. Hey, we know about hidden faces these days, right? I mean, you go to some store or something and, and somebody, everybody's got a mask on and it's hard to connect with people. It's hard to read people's face. And it's even worse if, if somebody sees you coming and they look away and they hide their face and they don't make eye contact because they're mad at you. That's a bad, bad feeling. David tells us that he deserves for God to avoid eye contact with him, for God to turn away from him in anger. David doesn't, doesn't argue with God. He doesn't say, God, you shouldn't reject or forsake me. Yeah, I, I don't deserve that. He doesn't say that. He said, please don't. He, just, he says, God, be merciful. God, be merciful to me. And just think about that. I mean, it's pretty stunning. This is, this is the person in the Old Testament before Jesus came, probably who was thought of as, as he's the man after God's own heart, right? Super close to God. And he could express such confidence in God. And he came to God empty-handed, begging for mercy, pleading with God not to hide his face, not to turn away in anger. Can you imagine doing that? I can. To say, God, <laughs> sit in my chair, and sometimes I just do it with my hands open, and say, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy. I can do that. that <laughs> I, uh, I can relate to that. God, I, I failed to trust and obey you yet again, to love you and to love people like I should. Have mercy on me, God. And then what, notice what David does. He preaches the gospel to himself. Even if the unthinkable happened, if, even if my father and mother forsake me, he says, the Lord will receive me. David's confident that God will never leave him or forsake him. And, and I just want to say that we have even more reason to know that, right? Because what, what do we know? On this side of Jesus, we know that God sent Jesus for us out of love. And we know that on the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God did forsake him. Jesus took our place with, of separation from God so that we can be welcomed and God can forgive us and accept us and, and make us his. And God says, when we trust in Jesus, nothing in all creation will separate us from the, his love in Jesus our Lord. We can have this confidence that God will not let us go. God will show us mercy when we ask for it. So, so behind the curtain of confidence, backstage we see David with this humble plea for God's warm embrace, along with a conviction of God's certain love, and then a plea for God to direct and God to protect. Verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path. 
<laughs> I read once that in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, even kings blew their noses into their sleeves. Or, or actually, kings wiped their noses on their servants' sleeves. Now, <laughs> since then, we've become more decorous, and, and we've learned about germs, right? We rely on scientists to teach us how to act. In fact, this just this past week, um, we got together a group of uh, five people. Three of them are in the medical field or uh, scientific field, and, and they're going to start thinking about, okay, how can we begin to come together safely as restrictions lift? How can we do that? Um, <laughs> I'm not, I have no clue, uh, but people who know the, their way around do. Now, think about it bigger now with, 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 with big life goals and with day-to-day -day choices. What we are doing, what we're do, what we're tempted to do is just follow our society's norms or do whatever seems reasonable to us, like the king blowing his nose in his servant's sleeve. Dumb, yeah, not good, but, but yeah, everybody's doing that. That's the norm. Hey, we, we don't have to go with whatever's, what everybody's doing. We, we, got a, we got an expert. We've got our creator. We've got our redeemer. We've got our God that we can ask to teach us. And David says, teach me. Teach me. Help me walk the straight path. Help me know which way to go because there's a lot of pressure to go the other way. Ask God. He's given us his word. He said, uh, there's a verse in Romans that says that those who are, he's given us his spirit. Those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. And the spirit of God will lead us to, to act in line with the word and, and have our, have our life, lives uh, dialed into God in a way that we never could if we just tried to figure it out by ourselves. God will answer. God will do things like bolster our hearts with the truth, like prompt us to reach out to a wise friend uh, just give us strength for th today. Sometimes the way God will prompt us by his word and by his spirit is to, is to help us put our pride away. You know, we, we've heard uh, comments from deacons uh, several weeks and saying, hey, if you need a hand, um, we're here to help. We've got a fund. We help each other if, there's, if you're stressing financially. And maybe one of the ways God will move in some of us is to say, you know, I really do need help. There's another person in our church that came to me and said, you know, I, I, I'm certified in, in counseling and, and I, I'd, I'd be help, glad to help somebody free of charge if in this time they really need a hand. And one of the ways God can prompt us and teach us is just by prompting us to say, okay, you know what, I need a hand here. This is really tough and, and I'm struggling. Ways that God can help. The prayer do not turn me over, verse 12. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes for false witnesses. False witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. They're out to get me, and they're lying. And you know, again, Jesus calls the devil the liar and the father of lies. So many lies, so many lies the devil throws at us in different ways, and sometimes they condense into just a couple big lies that, that, with different iterations. Well, I'm hopeless. That's a lie. And it's hopeless. The situation is hopeless. Those are lies. No, no. No matter what we face with God, there's hope. And so we pray. We ask God to direct us. We ask God to protect us. And now... Even if things aren't going so hot, even if we're not quite feeling it, you know, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is, even if we're not feeling all that, we're moving there. Verse 13, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so do we say to ourselves, we say to our kids, we say to people in our lives, we say to people who see, uh, who we've let backstage, we say, verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord.
That is living in hope rather than in fear. And remember, hope has three ingredients. Wishing, imagining, believing. Desire, vision, and faith. Psalm 27 helps us with all three, as does the Lord's Supper, to which we now turn. Pastor Brent spoke about hope, and we're in a time when we need hope. And throughout the history of the church, many Christians have been in difficult situations, much more difficult than what we know now, and they needed hope. And one of the main ways the Lord provided hope for them was through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Because as the Apostle Paul says, that whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes. And so this meal, this meal, though we can't share it in person, when we do share it, it is looking forward to a meal that we'll share together, a heavenly banquet, a celebration that not only did Christ triumph over death, but then he has triumphed over the forces of evil. He has brought his kingdom in full. And on that final day, we'll have this wonderful meal together to celebrate. But now, now we celebrate uh, what he has given us with the Lord's Supper. And again, I hope you have your elements ready. And as we begin, let's pray together those words that Jesus taught us, his disciples, for all time as we say the Lord's Prayer. Saying now, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his love endures forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are kind, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and that you've given us a new identity as your children through Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we can build our sure foundation on that, on him. And we give thanks too that your Holy Spirit draws us together as his people. And so now as we celebrate this meal that he's given us, we pray that you would use it to strengthen our faith and strengthen our sense of, sense of community. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, on the night when Jesus was arrested, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray over the elements. Dear Father in heaven, by the work of the Holy Spirit, through these gifts of the bread and the cup, we ask that you would unite us more fully with Jesus and with each other, that you would feed our faith, lift our hearts, so that we may live as your children with a joyful confidence, which shows others that, that like us, they need you because you give hope. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. And for any children among us who don't yet uh, receive the Lord's Supper, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you today and forevermore. And uh, if you're joining us online and, and wondering, oh, 
can I uh, take part in this? Uh, you know, uh, my first time with this group. Yes, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you look to him as the one who makes possible for the forgiveness of sins, and you look to him as your Lord, the one uh, for whom you live, the one who teaches you how to live. None of us does it perfectly in this lifetime, but if Jesus is the one who saves you and the one you look to as Lord, you are welcome to take part in, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The body of Christ was given for you. Take, eat, remember, and believe that Jesus gave himself. The blood of Jesus was shed for you. Take, drink, remember, and believe. His blood was given. pray. Dear Father, thank you for bringing us into your family and that you feed our faith. Thank you for the hope you give as we look back not only to what Jesus did with his disciples, but how he will share a grand meal with us one day. We pray that you would use this food and drink that we've received to nourish us, to strengthen us as we move toward that day. Amen. Thank you.
I want to leave you with a blessing. And after that, stay tuned for announcements. God go before you to lead you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. In the blessing of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we all say, Amen. Hi, I'm Mike Vandehar. I'm an elder and I'm the clerk of the River Terrace Church Council. I'm glad that you could worship with us today. Personally, I found our Sunday services to be very meaningful and encouraging, and I hope you have too. Pastor Brent's current sermons on the Psalms seem perfect for troubled times. The deacons have done a great job of reminding you that we as a church are here for you if you have financial needs. The elders, along with the pastoral care providers, want to remind you that we're also here if you have special spiritual needs so that we can lift you up in prayer. We want to encourage all members of our congregation to stay connected spiritually and socially, even while we are physically distanced. We encourage you to pray for each other and to call someone in our congregation who might need to hear an encouraging voice. Please keep your small groups going by Zoom or Skype or whatever other virtual software you might use. And if you want to join a group, let the church office know. Please pray for our pastors and our worship leaders as they minister to us remotely each week. Finally, I hope that you received your absentee ballots to vote for new elders and deacons in the mail this week. And please prayerfully consider the nominees and return your ballots soon. With God's help and with your church brothers and sisters behind you, I pray you will withstand whatever trials you might currently be facing. May God bless you and keep you. And we look forward to the day we can, when we can finally meet again in person. Thanks. Have a great day. Good morning, River Terrace. My name is Melissa Keeley, and I'm a deacon at the church. This morning's special offering is for VBS and children's activities. Although the church had to make the difficult decision to cancel this summer's VBS, this morning's special offering will continue to provide for children's activities throughout the year. These include the Winter Fun Day, the Fall Harvest Party, uh, preparations for the Christmas Eve service, as well as other celebrations and activities that Shalom, our children's minister, plans throughout the year. If you would like to make a gift to this special offering or to the church's general fund, you can do so by sending a check to the church or by making that gift online. We know that as people continue to shelter in place, that many people are experiencing financial hardship as they have um, suffered from job instability or unexpected bills. Throughout the year, the deacons collect for the Benevolence Fund, and this, the money in this account are earmarked to support the material and financial needs of members of our church and regular attenders. If you find yourself in need of support, I encourage you to reach out to a deacon, an elder, a minister, or a member of our staff. Any requests are considered confidentially, and the money that you receive is a gift. Thank you.